Good morning. You're a good looking bunch again this week. I like the 1045 miracle. Do you know what that is? About 1040, there's 15 or 20 people in here. About 1045, they start trickling in. We're glad you're here this morning. We hope that you'll be blessed. We have part of our congregation, our Pathfinder Club, which is similar to a Boy Scout Club, is worshiping at White Memorial. But today we've come to worship the Lord, to be blessed as we go to his word just now. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can gather into your house to worship you. As we do so, Father, we would ask that you would deepen our faith, that you would give us further insights from passages that we have read often, that our walk with you will be clearer and stronger as we spend time with you, make us more like Jesus. We ask it in his precious name. Amen. Every time I study about the life of Christ, I am moved deeply into a closer relationship with him. Even if they're very familiar passages, what seems to be a very familiar passage at first, the gems of truth turn ever so slightly, and the rays of truth bring about a brilliance and a greater appreciation for his life. Wouldn't that, it would be amazing to have lived in the time of Jesus. Do you believe that, friends? But wherever Jesus went, it seemed that trouble followed. For the more he did good in healing others and blessing others, there was a group of people off in the distance that just waited to plot his downfall. Time and time again, we're going through the book of John. Last week, we looked at John chapter 6, where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And he is sustaining us through his spirit. This week, we're going to look at John chapter 8 and John chapter 9. We're not skipping over 7. Seven is dealing with the accusations of the Jewish leaders. How is it you say and claim to be God? And Jesus rebukes them. And then in John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. And we're going there in just a moment. But I want you to open your Bibles first to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 and 10, because I believe it will give us an arc that will span one end of our message to the other. First Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. It reads, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, the words that you've heard, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received what? You have received mercy. We can close the book and we can go home. What an amazing proclamation, isn't it? You're a chosen generation. You are a holy nation. You have been called out of darkness into his magnificent, marvelous light. And mercy and blessing has been 
poured out upon you. And all the people said, Amen. What a proclamation. But let me ask you, do you ever have a difficult day? Do you ever struggle in your spiritual experience? Are there ever times when you say, Lord, I know that I am yours, but all of that light that you're shining, I could use a little bit more in my life right now. If that's the case from time to time, I would invite you to read carefully the scriptures that we will be examining and allow them to flow into your life today. In John chapter 8, our anchor text is verse 12. I'd invite you to turn to John chapter 8, verse 12, because we'll pick out um, our anchor verse today to lay the foundation. This passage um, is subtitled in the New American Standard, Jesus is the light of the world. And we start there with Jesus proclaiming who he is to the Jews once again. The Jews didn't get it. The Jews had a certain description of how the Messiah would come. And it's amazing in today's society that almost every major denomination has a doctrine of his second coming, uh, who Jesus is, what he's about. And they will wrestle with and struggle with who Jesus is. And today, there are, there are millions of people that struggle with, can Jesus be trusted? Is he the, just another light? Is he the light of the world? How does he relate in my life? So he proclaims in John chapter 8, verse 12, Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. A simple proclamation at first, simply proclaiming that he was the light of the world. The Pharisees said unto him, You are testifying about yourself, but your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said unto them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you don't know where I came from or where I am going. It's interesting. He met, he met them right where they were. There is no question that comes to God that if you ask honestly and sincerely, that he will not answer. Do you believe that, friends? You may wrestle with what other people say. You may argue philosophies, but the place to go is right to Jesus and ask him, Jesus, what is the truth of the matter? What does your scripture say? How shall I order my life? What shall I believe? Amongst, amongst all of the doctrine, all of the philosophies that the world puts forward, how am I to so order my life that it will be pleasing to you, Father, that I will follow your Son? And Jesus' simple proclamation is, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have my life. Walking in the light of Jesus is to continue in his word and to follow him. But there's an interesting way that Jesus introduces that subject. Because if you're following in John chapter 8, he doesn't start, John doesn't start the chapter with the proclamation of Jesus. There's a story there in verses 1 through 11 that you know, that you've read perhaps many times. And if you look in context, it seems to be out of place and disjointed at best. But let's unpack it for just a little bit here, so that we can put the flow of John 8 in context to understand what this light is all about. In John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, is a story of the woman caught in the act of adultery. 
the Pharisees bring her to Jesus and proclaim to Jesus, here's a woman, we found her in the very act of adultery. What do you say, Jesus? Shall we stone her with a full realization to trap Jesus? For they said the laws of Moses required that she be stoned. And if you agree with the laws of Moses, you will be observing Roman law. So no matter how Jesus answered the question, he would be found guilty of something. It's amazing to me, friends, when people bring their arguments, does God exist? What about this? Is it this way or that way? It's often predicated to lead down a pathway that dishonors God. Rather than starting with God and starting with Christ and saying, what would Jesus have me to believe? Do you believe that's the place to start? I do, friends. Jesus simply proclaimed, I am the light of the world. Here were the religious leaders of the day who thought they had sight who thought they were walking in the light of their Heavenly Father, and they're bringing these accusations to Jesus. Now, what they don't, uh, what the Scripture doesn't describe in detail, if you have the book Desire of Ages, read the chapter, Light of the World. She describes there that as the religious leaders brought this woman to Jesus, it was customary and the, the law, the religious law of the day required that there would be two witnesses that would bring the accusation. And the only one that would, uh, was allowed to bring the adulterer to the authorities, religious leaders, or Christ himself, was the spouse, the husband. So here we have the religious leaders, the husband is missing, and they're bringing, uh, they're bringing her to Jesus. They are without standing in the recognized order. They have no standing uh, before Jesus, religious authorities, or the law, because the only one that could bring the accusation was the husband. So what is Jesus going to do? Now, now just, just before you draw the conclusion, you already know the end of the story. Let's flash back. Let's flash back. To the verse in Peter that we read. Out of darkness into his marvelous light, you are filled with, what did the scripture say? What did it say? Mercy. 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 Christ's light of the world is predicated on his acts of mercy. Before he proclaims that he is the light of the world, he is going to show by example and tell a story that displays his mercy. It's absolutely incredible to me that the stories seem at first so disjointed. But when you understand the purpose of the light of Jesus and the way that he wants to draw those who come to him into his mercy, it's an incredible flow. So Jesus, Jesus looks at the woman. The woman has no doubt, no doubt in her mind. Her life is filled with darkness. The doubt, the guilt, the darkness of shame, the darkness of certain judgment that's about to fall upon her. And Jesus looks in her eyes and sees the loneliness sees the longing of her soul and looks beyond the accusations that are being hurtled her way. And he simply bends down and he starts to write in the dust of the ground with his fingers. What will the writing say? Stone her? She is guilty. Send her home. They all gather around. They think they're going to have their way with Jesus. They think finally he's going to be, he's going to be found guilty of something and we will be able to have our way with him. 
His holy finger writes in the dirt of their unholy actions. And slowly he starts to write the sins of one accuser after the other. One trails off quietly without a word. Another leaves as his sin is written in the dust of the ground. He starts with the third, and to nobody else's knowledge, without a name, he writes the sins of that accuser who leaves, until, until it's only the two of them. And the woman looks at Jesus. How is he going to judge me? And Jesus simply echoes those words from the throne of grace. Woman, where are your accusers? Where are your accusers? It's obvious they're gone. And he simply says, go and sin no more. It is an amazing story. It's not that he said, it doesn't matter what you've done. What he's saying is, I'm all about giving you another chance. My mercy, my mission is not to pass judgment. I come from the throne of grace to extend to you mercy today. You would miss all of his saying if this story had not predicated his proclamation. Do you get it? Because before he proclaims that he's the light of the world, with the full realization that the majority of people walk in the darkness of sin every single day, he wants us to know he's a merciful God. Can you say amen? amen. He wants us to know when we struggle day in and day out, when we struggle with doubt and discouragement, when we struggle with faith, when we struggle with sinning time and time again, he says, turn from the darkness of your ways and look to the light. I am the light. There is no other light in the world. Turn to me and you will find mercy. You may not find it in your spouse. You may not find it in the fellow church members sitting around you. You may not find it in the pastor of the church. You may not find it in your colleagues at work. But you can find it in me because I am the light of the world. And if you forget everything else that I've ever said, never forget that. He is first merciful. And while others will judge you, he will not. He will, he says, but he will be merciful first. The Jews were troubled. How can anyone proclaim themselves to be light of the world and they've missed it? How can anyone proclaim that he is the great I am, claiming the title that only God has? They had not blessed him and they couldn't see through their spiritual darkness. But John chapter 8, verse 12, is couched between the woman caught in the act of adultery and John chapter 9. We have to look at John chapter 9 to better understand John chapter 8, verse 12. John chapter 9, you can read, uh, you can follow along and you... Um, Read with me, John chapter 9, uh, verses 1 through 3. It's a story of a man who is blind. 
And the Jews passed by. As he passed by, he saw a blind man from birth. If you want to think about darkness, walking in darkness, I can't imagine what it would be like to be blind from birth. Absolute blind. Can't see anything. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, It was neither that this man has sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am the light of the world, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then verse 6 says, And when he had said this, he spat on the ground, he made a little clay with a spittle and applied it to the the clay to his eyes and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so he went there and washed and he came back seeing. Oh, I just love the way Jesus works. Don't you? You have a trouble, you come to Jesus. You feel guilty for what you've done, come to Jesus. There's mercy. There's forgiveness. He'll tell you, just go and don't do it again. He gets it. You have a problem? Come to Jesus. You don't see things? You you know, you don't see things? Jesus can reach through and take away your blindness. For you see, we all are partially blind today. Oh, you say, but wait a minute, Pastor. How can that be? What do you mean? I see 2020 without glasses. I see 1520 with them. I'm not spiritually blind. I got all the theology. I need your help just for a minute. Okay? Need your help. We're going to take a 15-second break here. You're all looking. Most of you are looking at me. I want you to turn, turn around and look at the exit sign behind me. Just turn around. Turn around. See the exit side in the back of the church? Everybody turn around. Nobody's going to bite you. Don't look at me. Just keep looking at the exit sign. You see the exit sign? All right. Now, don't, don't move your head. You're looking at the exit sign. You should be looking at the exit sign. Can you see me? Well, you must be blind. You can turn around. We have pretty good vision, don't we? But we have blind spots in our life. I can't see what's behind me. I can barely see what's in front of me. When I'm driving, it takes two of us. I'm sure that I have more blind spots in my life than even what my wife can see. But we have blind spots, and why do I even mention that? Because we're so quick to see things that other people don't that we just have to tell them about. I've got this revelation, this recent revelation about Jesus. You need to understand it this way. We are just as blind and in need of healing in different areas of our life as the blind man was when he came to Jesus. Do you believe that, friends? Different spots in our lives. I was so sure about this piece of doctrine and this theology. Institutionally, we understood it this way in one part of the world. But yet, the scriptures say this. And we need to go to Jesus and just ask him to open our eyes and open our hearts. And then the man in verse 17, and then they said unto the blind man again, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. The Jews then did not believe him that he had been blind and that he would received sight until they called the parents of the one who had received sight and questioned him and said, Is this your son? 
And they said, yes, he's old enough to speak for himself. He's of age, ask him. And a second time they said to the man in verse 24, who had been blind, and he said unto them, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And he answered, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. I don't know, friend, what God wants to show you. But what I do know with a great degree of certainty is that in each of our lives, there are patches and patterns of darkness. In each of our lives, there are things that we don't see about our own characters. In each of our hearts, there are areas that God wants to work that we just cling to so tightly. But if we, like the blind men, will come to Jesus, He will open our spiritual eyes, and that light, that light of the world will flood our souls and our hearts and transform us, and we will go forth to proclaim that it is Jesus, it is Jesus who has done this for me, who has shared this with me, and let me tell you, He is Lord indeed, and I will follow Him. He says, I am the light of the world. And what is the response? What is our response today to the light of the world? He's filled with mercy. He's filled with healing. He's filled with giving us light. There is, in the Scripture, many references to walking in the light rather than in darkness and abiding with Him. And I have to scratch my head. Why would anyone want to walk in darkness when you can walk in light? Simple question, isn't it? But there are people who just want to argue philosophy. Tell me, tell me, when's the last time, it, the arguments go like something like this. When's the last time you've seen Jesus? Hmm. Now let me ask you a question. When you were looking at the exit light, could you see me? Did I exist? I, you knew I existed, but you couldn't see me. Is that pretty clear, pretty simple logic? Sure, we have evidence from Scripture. If you believe in Scripture, Scripture is clear. He is the light of the world. Don't let anyone, anyone change that for you. Your authority starts not in public opinion. Your authority starts not in what you want to believe. Your authority doesn't start with how you understand the world. Your authority starts in what the Word of God proclaims. These are not just human words. These are words from the throne of grace. I am the light of the world. And when we take that into our life, it changes everything. It fills our hearts and lives with the understanding that God first, in His character, wants us to understand He is first merciful. He is first merciful. He is second leading. He is giving us the light. Why would you walk in darkness? And, it, you know, it just boggles my mind. I tried to visualize this this week, putting 200 people in complete darkness and saying, why don't you journey 20 miles together without any light? It would be chaos, wouldn't it? But there are some who will say, there is no guide to life, and so I will just figure it out. I will gather up all the darkness so I can somehow have light. doesn't work that way. The best way to do it is to follow the light you have, and I will guarantee you, you will have plenty of light. God just turns on the light when somebody comes to him and says, Lord, show me the way. He doesn't turn it on full power. He lights a little candle and he says, follow the candle. He adds a little more power. He adds a little more power until you're in the fullness of daylight and you can follow wherever he leads. This is the God that I know is portrayed in John chapter 8 and John chapter 9. The Jews would have you believe there is no mercy, only judgment. The Jews would have you believe the troubles in your life are because of your sins or your parents' sins. And the only thing is you need forgiveness. And the truth is, the truth is you need the guide of Jesus Christ, the light of the world, to bring that mercy, to bring that presence. 
to bring that leading, to bring that abiding, to bring that walk so that you will walk next to him. There's one last thought. It's an interesting thing about light. Imagine a great big light bulb here. A 100,000 watt light bulb. It's huge right here. It's the greatest piece of technology. It's a great light bulb. Anybody here powered up? It's in a base. It's got a tail. It's not plugged in. Is it giving off any light? has all of the capabilities, all of the potential. But it's not until it's plugged in and the switch is turned on that it gives light. So too with our lives. Christ, the energy of light, wants to flow through us that we will become an embodiment of the light of the world to those we come in contact with. It's only as His Holy Spirit flows in to our lives and we embrace the light of the world that we can share that light with others. For indeed, you are a holy people. You are a chosen people. Call all of darkness into His marvelous light to proclaim his mercy. May God bless you.